next five ten minutes we are going to discuss descriptive study design. This is very very important for undergraduates, which will be asked as a most common essay question. We are going to start from this end, right? So we don't have any comparison group. So descriptive studies do not feature a comparison group. Descriptive studies are often the first initiative for any study that describe the frequency, naturalistic, and possible determinants. Possible determinants. That means we can only formulate an hypothesis. That means we can only say that this could be an outcome. This could be a cause. Okay, so hypothesis generation about the cause of the disease can be done in the descriptive study. So they do not allow assessments of causal association, right? So descriptive studies, with the help of descriptive studies, we cannot come to a conclusion of this is the causative factor, but we can propose this could be a causative factor as an hypothesis that hypothesis generation can be done in descriptive study design at the end of the descriptive study design. So let us see. So good descriptive study design answers the five basic questions. Who? Who has the disease? What? What is the disease? Why? Why did the condition arise? When? When or where? So where does or does not the disease or condition arise? All these questions, if you try to answer all these questions and also including the fifth question or sixth, sorry, sixth question, so what? Right? So if you try to answer all these questions, then you can formulate an hypothesis at the end of the descriptive study. So there are some examples given in this slide. Uh, case report, case series report or surveillance studies, all are examples for basic descriptive studies. Say well, how case report, just uh, how a symptomatic presentation is present, uh, being presented by an individual is presented as case report. So similar type of cases presented with maybe a typical symptoms or atypical manifestation of a particular disease is being studied among some five to 10 people or some numbers that becomes a case series report, right? So surveillance studies are done in the field. So all these three are examples for descriptive study designs. So let us see the step by step of each uh, study, uh, uh, descriptive study design. Defining the population, right? So first, when you want to do a descriptive study design, first, you have to be very careful in defining the population. That means to whom you are going to do the study. So population should be defined not only in terms of number, that means 1,000, 500, not only in terms of number, but also in terms of the composition of the population, in terms of age, gender, occupation, geographical area, cultural characteristics, everything you have to decide before you start doing the study. Next important thing is what disease that you are going to do the study as a study among this population. That means define the disease under study. Epidemiologist needs a definition which is more precise and valid, which means the definition has to be more operational, operational in the sense the definition has to be more quantifiable rather than giving a theoretical definition, right? So define the disease under study and that definition should be more precise and accurate, which means valid. So once the definition is established, the definition should be added through the study design and it cannot be changed in between. The next important step is describing the disease in terms of time, place and person, which I said the distribution can do you know the three components of epidemiology? Yes, there are three components of epidemiology. One is disease frequency, second one is distribution, and third one is determinants, right? So in that distribution only, we describe the disease in terms of time, place, and person distribution. So describe the occurrence and distribution of disease by time, place, and person, which includes systematic collection and analysis of data. Yes, let us see about time distribution. So time distribution is classified into short term, periodic and long term. So what is that short term fluctuation? That means sudden increase in number of cases outnumbering the expected occurrence is called as an epidemic. So that is called a short term fluctuation. There are certain diseases which occur periodically every six months or uh, every maybe maybe uh, during some particular seasons or particular climatic conditions, those things come under periodic fluctuations and long-term trends taking so many years for a disease to come and then uh, increase in prevalence. So let us see one by one, what are the short-term fluctuations? So short-term fluctuations are again classified into, as, I, as we have discussed, short-term fluctuations are also called as an epidemic, right? So short-term fluctuation can be classified as two things. One is common source epidemic under which we classify into single source, that means Common source, single exposure, 
common source multiple exposure okay right and next important thing in short term fluctuation is propagated epidemic we will be seeing the characteristic features of all these types of epidemic and then slow epidemic these are all different examples for different types of epidemics so common source single exposure or it is also called as point source most of the examiners and most of the even in the exams also the question is will be asked in terms of point source epidemic students so please be careful about this particular word also the classical example is food poisoning say for example in a hostel if yeah, hostel day celebration is happening in a hospital in a in a hostel students are eating a common food more than 500 students are eating a common food of which 300 to 400 students are developing the signs and symptoms of food poisoning within 24 hours which is a classical example for point source epidemic so the features are the exposure to a disease agent is brief and simultaneous because all the students who ate the food at the same time. So all cases occur within one incubation, of course, because the exposure is simultaneous and cases also will occur within one incubation period. So when you draw the epidemic curve, the curve will have only one peak, will not, which will not have any secondary waves. And all the cases, that means clustering of cases occur within a narrow interval of time, which means within one incubation period. And very importantly, if this cannot happen always due to exposure to infectious agents. There are some more examples like Bhopal gas, gas tragedy and all those things. The source is a single source, but the epidemic will take so many, so much of years, or so, many, so much months time. So that is also an example for point source epidemic. So it is not always due to exposure to an infectious agent. Here, I have just given an example for poison as an, as an example for single source or point source epidemic, right? So next is the characteristic curve. If you draw the curve, most of the time there will be a sudden rise and sudden fall and most common form of transmission foodborne disease in which a large population is exposed for a short period of time. When you draw the curve, look at this index case or common vehicle exposure. There will be a sudden increase in number of cases and there will be decrease in number of cases within a short span of time, which is called as an example for point source epidemic, right? And next, yeah, shall we see an example for an MCQ for that particular question? All are true about point source epidemic except no secondary waves occurs within a specific period. All cases occur abruptly and simultaneously, always due to infectious agent. Yes, not always. That is a fourth point which we have discussed as an important point in point source epidemic so point source epidemic not always due to infectious agent all the remaining three are correct so exception is d right so we'll see the next common source multiple exposure epidemic the exposure from the same source may be prolonged continuous repeated not necessarily at the same time so this sentence itself will give you that so if the exposure is repeated and continuous so not all the cases will occur at the same time the example is commercial sex worker uh, transmitting gonorrhea. Uh, whenever the clients uh, go to her and then get get the get the infection from her, they will develop signs and symptoms according to the incubation period. So all the cases will never occur within one incubation period. So the epidemic will cross beyond the range of one incubation period, and there won't be any evidence of secondary cases from the infected persons. Okay, right? But we will be having a secondary curves, not the secondary cases. Yeah. The characteristic feature of the curve will be like this. If you draw the curve and you will be getting one curve here and one curve here, one curve here, you will have multiple secondary waves will be present in common source, multiple exposure. And next is propagated epidemic. Yeah, the name itself says that propagated means most often of infectious in origin, which means infectious means results from person to person transmission of an infectious agent. The curve shows a gradual rise and tails up over a longer period of time, just an opposite to point source epidemic. In point source epidemic, as we have discussed, there will be a sudden rise and sudden fall. But in propagated epidemic, there will be a gradual rise and slow fall, or you can say that there will be a tailing of epidemic will be present in the propagated epidemic, but which means till that large number of susceptible population gets completely depleted. The disease agent may be continuously transmitted from person to person so that it will, there will be a tailing of the epidemic, right? See, this will be the nature of the curve. See, there will be an increase in number of cases and there will be a decrease. But suddenly, if the infectious agent gets into a vulnerable population, those who are not having immunity, suddenly there will be increase in number of cases. So this will be the characteristic feature of propagated epidemics, which is most often infectious in origin. 
So next in time fluctuation, common source single exposure and common source multiple exposure that we have finished. Now we are in periodic fluctuation where we have seasonal trend and cyclical trend. Let us see what is seasonal trend. As we know some of the diseases like measles, malaria, malaria for example, as we know in and around the monsoon or in monsoon season or post monsoon season, we have monsoon season, you will be having an increase in number of cases of malaria or any other vector borne disease. That's a classical example for seasonal trend. So seasonal trend is mainly decided by the climatic conditions. And similarly, some of the examples like cyclical trends, there are certain diseases like uh, influenza. Influenza, it will happen every three to five years or every seven to ten years. In between, there, is, there will be a long interval. Right? What happens in between? So, which means the influenza virus changes its an antigen. As we all know, influenza has got two antigen, H antigen and N antigen. So, antigenic shift and antigenic drift, all those things are there for about influenza. So these influenza pandemics or epidemics are classical examples for cyclical trend. The important factor which decides the cyclical trend is the antigenic variation and the vulnerable population or the herd immunity, herd structure. All those things are factors that decides the cyclical trend. Yeah, long term or secular trend, long term, the name itself says that consistent tendency to change in a particular direction or a definite movement in one direction, example is coronary artery disease or diabetes. Say for example, in India, 20, 30 years before, we didn't have this many number of coronary artery disease or diabetes due to change in our lifestyle and dietary habits and all those things. There is a consistent change of this particular disease in one direction, especially making the prevalence of diabetes and coronary artery disease very, very high. So which is called as a secular trend. Yeah. Let us see in MCQ, seasonal variation or trend of a disease can be assessed by comparing the prevalence, comparing the incidence, calculating the survival rates, calculating the mortality rates. So when you want to see the trend, that is a key word in the stem of the question. When if you want to see the trend, you always look at the new cases, which means comparing the incidence of disease, not the prevalence alone. We have to compare the incidence in order to find out the seasonal variation or the trend of a disease which is not true reason for cyclical trend. As I have discussed with you about the cyclical trend, cyclical trend is mainly dis, uh, decided by the antigenic variation of the agent, which is influenza, for example, and herd structure, which I have told you that, which means herd immunity, which is indirectly related to buildup of susceptibility. All these three are very important characteristic features, but the environmental condition, more importantly, environmental and climatic conditions is mainly for seasonal trend, not for cyclical trend. So here the exception is environmental condition. So we are in the third step that is describing a disease in terms of place and person distribution. We have described the time distribution in terms of time distribution. We have seen so many uh, classifications, short term, periodic and long term classifications of different types of epidemic. Now we are in place distribution and person distribution. Like place distribution says that geographic differences in disease occurrence is an important dimension of a descriptive study. That itself will give you a lot of clues. The classical example is migration studies, my dear students. Migration studies may be asked as a prima question. Kindly go and read it. Uh, some one paragraph is given in the part textbook about migration studies. So next is person distribution. Defining the disease by defining the persons who develop the disease in terms of age, sex or occupation or whatever may be the characteristics for person distribution and then the fourth important step is measurement of disease amount of disease as i have told you three important components of epidemiology the first important component is disease frequency how you measure the disease frequency disease frequency measured in terms of rate ratio and proportion that means you measure the amount of disease how many are affected disease load burden in terms of prevention prevalence measurement of measures of morbidity in terms of incidence and prevalence so measurement of disease amount of disease then comparing with known indices because we don't have as such any comparison group in descriptive studies so we compare with known indices already existing and that will give clues to the etiology so that you can formulate an hypothesis at the end of the descriptive study as i have told you descriptive studies are always the initial study designs to be done for any bigger studies are going before going into for a case control cohort or randomized control trials we are supposed to do a basic descriptive study to formulate your own hypothesis. This hypothesis, once it is being formulated, can be tested with the help of analytical studies. So for, for formulating a hypothesis, we need five important things. The population, what is the cause, what is the outcome, what is the dose, and what is the 
time response. Say for example, smoking causes lung cancer is the hypothesis which we are proposing at the end of the descriptive study. Here in smoking causes lung cancer hypothesis, we have only the exposure and the outcome. Exposure to smoking, outcome is lung cancer. So we should actually include the population dose response and also the time response. So what is the dose response and time response and including population? Say for example, the same hypothesis can be formulated like this way. Smoking of more than 10 cigarettes for more than 10 years duration among more than 40 year old males will develop lung cancer which include all the characteristics of population that is more than 40 years. Dose response which is more than 10 cigarettes, time response more than 10 years, everything is given here and the cause and the outcome is cause of smoking and the outcome is lung cancer, right? So be very careful in formulating an hypothesis because this is a very, very important outcome of a descriptive study. So we are almost at the end of our slide, uh, our presentation uh, today, session today. While formulating a hypothesis, all the following should be specified in hypothesis except population, dose response, time response, geographical trend. So geographical trends may or may not be useful in formulation of hypothesis, but five important characteristic features are very important for formulating a hypothesis. Please convey, please uh, tell the answer along with me students, what are the five important characteristic features which are needed for formulation of hypothesis. Population, exposure, outcome, dose response and time response. So thank you so much, my dear students. So we are, we have finished. Sorry for that uh, slideshow. We are actually have planned for case control and course in the next session. So thank you so much, medicine group, and also the listeners, those who listen to this video, and kindly uh, give give us your feedback. So thank you so much.